The following program presents principles designed to promote good health and is not intended to take the place of personalized professional care. The opinions and ideas expressed are those of the speaker. Viewers are encouraged to draw their own conclusions about the information presented. Hello and welcome to Health for a Lifetime. I'm your host, Don McIntosh, and today we're going to be talking about an important and troubling subject, eating disorders. And joining us in the studio today to talk about this is Jennifer Swerger. She has a web page, jenniferjill.org, and uh, she's done a very important book, Dying to be Beautiful. And I highly recommend the book, and we're glad that you're with us today. It's good to be here. Uh, the reason I like the book is the research, uh, the, the team you pulled together, and then the fact that you're writing it from you know, the perspective of a survivor, someone who's been through it. Survivor. Uh, mm -hmm. Many times you've got uh, people that write books about this that never had the problem, and, and they just don't have that, you know, that warmth that comes from the different stories. You said there's about like 10 different testimonies in the book, and and then the information. Um, talking about eating disorders, we're talking about anorexia and bulimia. Bulimia. And uh, just a quick definition of what those are. Okay, anorexia is uh, characterized by obsession with thinness, and anorexics limit the amount of food. So there, it's basically self-starvation. Mm -hmm. Bulimia, in contrast, is a binging and purging disease, consuming large quantities of foods, typically high calorie foods, and then finding some way of eliminating them through vomiting or laxatives or exercise. You know, in your book you talk about how we got here as a culture. Yeah. We talked about the social factors, the right. biological factors, the so psychological factors, all these different things. We talked about how the culture has changed from being fat is in, or fat's where it's at, to thin is in, and, and how models get thinner, but people are in reality are getting fatter getting and that fatter. disparity. Talk about all these different things. And by the way, you know, uh, I'm glad you have the web page and you have a lot of this information for people that want to review that. Uh -huh. uh, but in this program, you really want to talk about how to help someone that has an eating disorder. Yeah, I'm assuming that some of the people listening have a loved one or a friend that they suspect might have either anorexia or bulimia. And they want to help that individual, so I want to go over some techniques and some things. So what are some of those techniques? Well, I want to start out by saying that helping, um, well, let, let's just sort of give an overview here with this next graphic. We want, to, we want to encompass three steps in our helping attempts. One is disclosure, then decision, and then connection. What I mean by disclosure is you want to get the person to admit that they're having this problem or that they're struggling with this problem. Sometimes that's real hard. That's very difficult, and in a couple minutes, I'm going to talk about how to how to make that approach. And okay. then, so you want them to disclose. You want them to say, "Yes, you're right. You know, your suspicions are confirmed. I am struggling." And that's the entering point. And then you want to bring them to a decision to do something about it, because just mm -hmm. disclosing isn't enough. You want them to come to the place where they're like, "Okay, you're right. I need to get help because this is." a dangerous situation. And then finally, you want to connect them with the people that are going to be able to help them. And that involves you doing some legwork, you doing some reading up on these disorders. A good place to start is the book, um, but there's very, very many resources out there. There's a couple of websites that you can look at. There's one called somethingfishy.org. I don't know why it's called that, but it has a lot about eating disorders. Uh, you can just do a Google search. And you need to start reading up and start understanding some of these things and then look in your local area and try to find resources that you can connect that person to so that you have those options right there. You want them to um, engage their own will in seeking help because they're not really going to be helped unless they're involved in the process. However, you want to make it as easy for them as possible. So, so disclosure. Disclosure, decision, connection. Decision, connection. I like that. Okay, so the first part is often the hardest. Um, that's the disclosure, getting them to admit that they really do have a problem. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about that for a moment here. Let's look at the next graphic. Your initial approach is going to weigh heavily in terms of your success or failure at this. 
you've got to be very careful with what you say to a person with an eating disorder because remember they're obsessed with the way that they look they're obsessed with food this is on their mind constantly this is kind of their world so if you say you look so thin that's bad because they think they're a failure that's right they're translating it you're a failure if you say it looks as though you're gaining weight they translate it you're fat if you say boy you sure ate a lot they translate it it's time to purge you pig you know so they have a cognitive distortion going on and they're going to read into what you're saying you're going to try to encourage them they're going to read it wrong so you have to be very careful how you approach them. Oh, wow, that's interesting. So they really have some distortions and you could just feed into it. You have to have a lot of tact and you have to, um, you have to pray. I think it's, it's time for prayer when, when you're facing a, a life or death issue like that. Okay, so then what's the next step? Okay, so then you want to connect them with some helping resources in their community or, or wherever. Um, there are some online resources, but I always think it's, it's better to first try to find right. someone that they can help get help from face to face. Mm -hmm. So I want to look at some of the options for therapy. Let's look at that. Behavioral okay. therapy you're going to talk about? Okay, let's look at this graphic. Behavioral therapy is one of the therapies that's out there for treating eating disorders, and that involves a technique called desensitization. I want to develop this for a moment here. Desensitization is simply pairing deep relaxation with imagining or envisioning whatever it is you're afraid of. And so often with, for instance, anorexia, there's a food phobia. You're afraid of food, you're afraid to eat. So pairing deep relaxation with visioning food can often take the edge off of that fear. Now hmm. some people might have an issue with that. They might think it's too new age. I believe that prayer accomplishes the same thing. Hmm. When you have a, a stressful situation and you pray about it, what you're doing is you're effectively bringing that situation, bringing yourself face to face with that situation in the presence of God. That's and conviction of the Holy Spirit, what's right, what's wrong, and the fact that it matters, right? That's right, but you're also, you're also taking a place where you're safe, which is in God's presence. Mm -hmm. And you're bringing that issue into God's presence. And so it takes the sting out of it. So then you're prepared. You know, have you ever had that experience where you are afraid of something, you're anxious, you're concerned, you pray about it, and you're able to face it with mm -hmm. courage. So I think the same thing is accomplished uh, with prayer as it's accomplished with desensitization. Let's go back to that graphic. Uh, another Behavioral modification. Another proponent of behavioral therapies. Behavioral mod is just rewarding good behavior, punishing bad behavior. The point of behavioral therapy is arresting behavior, which is important, particularly in the case of anorexia where there's malnutrition because the brain is a physical organ. If it's not properly nourished, you're not going to be able to change the well, thought patterns. You need patterns. to stop it. So you need to arrest the behavior. The problem with behavioral therapy is there's a high relapse rate because you don't deal with the root problem. So usually behavioral therapy needs to be combined with something else, and that is cognitive therapy. So then we have cognitive behavioral therapy, which is real big right now, coming from Aaron Beck and Albert Ellis, uh, these different kinds of cognitive therapy that deal with both behaviors and underlying thinking. So you're arresting the behavior, but you're also dealing with the root cause of the behavior. One of the ways of doing this is something I call bibliotherapy. Just start reading about it. There are many self-help books out there on eating disorders. Not all of them are as valuable as others, but if you can just start cracking the box, so to speak, and getting out there and informing yourself, it can take the mystique out of something. There's lots of online resources. And you're saying the people that need to read this is not the people so much suffering as those that are trying to Both. help. Both. Both. Yes. Okay. Bibliotherapy is a type of cognitive therapy. Okay. So there's lots of online information. And then there's also talk therapy. And sometimes in a counseling situation, a counselor can identify where that person's thoughts become distorted, become catastrophized, become negative where they don't need to be. And they can help that person bring those thoughts back in line with reality. So that's cognitive behavioral therapy. Is that very effective? And it's, it's quite effective. But I'm going to get to effectiveness a little bit later on okay. down the line. It, overall, it is effective, especially with depression and anxiety-related disorders. Psychodynamic? So, psychodynamic therapy is, is basically Freudian. Uh, it stems from Freudian psychoanalysis, dwelling heavily upon the past. Uh, this is where you find a client's recovering memories. The problem with psychodynamic, the psychodynamic approach is that overall it has never really been proven effective. Freud's their, uh, theories were never really tested. He lived at a time where they didn't have much empirical testing and there wasn't as much peer pressure within the psychological community. So his theories were never proven and this has not been proven effective. And then, uh, you know, one thing you said before is that many times people that are anorexics also have in the past many times uh, cases incest. of incest. Yeah. So 
wouldn't you want to go back and discover that? Yes. I think that there is a place for understanding the person. When you have a person sitting before you, you have a history sitting before you. And you as a therapist need to know something about that history so that you can help them connect the dots between what happened and who they are now and also so you can build trust with them. But dwelling, there's a difference between understanding the past and its impact on the present and dwelling heavily and ruminating on the past. It reaches a point with the heavily dwelling on the past where it becomes, I think, self-destructive. So we've talked about behavioral, cognitive, psychoanalysis, okay. or psychoanalytical dynamic, dynamic and then family therapy. Family therapy. Okay, I want to look at the next graphic here. It used to be that they would do what's called a parentectomy for someone with an eating disorder. They felt they needed to be taken out of their family system because often it was dynamics within the family system that was predisposing a person to the eating disorder and, in fact, fueling that eating disorder. So they take them out and they move the parents they out of the picture. They don't do it anymore. But they don't do it anymore. They, they recognize that because the person would go back into the family system and they'd relapse. So now they deal with the entire family system. And sometimes a family system can support a disorder, but it can work in the positive as well. The family system can be taught to support recovery from the disorder. Good. So yeah, you work family with the family. Systems theory, Often, theory. you know, when you're doing individual counseling, then you'll eventually bring the family in. Support groups? Are okay, they good? support groups are valuable for bringing people out of isolation. One of the great um, the, the motivators in ad any given addiction can be the sense of isolation. You feel like you're the only person with this problem. And sometimes coming out of isolation can be a positive move. Those include reading groups, uh, talking or rap groups, not as in rap music, but talking. Mm -hmm. um, online chat. The caution with support groups is sometimes people relive their, uh, their falls, so to speak, or their temptations. This is true of Alcoholics Anonymous. They will not allow a person in an AA group, a good group, will not allow them to recount in detail their drunken binges. They can say, I messed up, but they can't go into detail because they experience what's called the dry drunk. They experience again a second time. So the same thing can happen with any addiction. So you need to be cautious that it doesn't become just a way of ruminating in your problem, that you're actually working towards solving it. Is with there a medication? Group. And medications have been proven, um, have been helpful, I should say, especially in bulimia because of its uh, genetic connection to major affective disorder. So um, that which works on depression can also work sometimes on bulimia, less often on anorexia. So that Some of those helpful. serotonin reuptake That's inhibitors right. and all those different Paxil, mm -hmm. all those different kind of things, sometimes in the short term or whatever the doctor says can be addressing the underlying issue. You know, I want to say something at this point, and that is I struggle with depression. Um, and I have found that taking a walk, I did some reading, Neil Nedley and some other things, and uh, I read about recovery. sunlight, and uh, mm -hmm. I decided to start walking in the morning, and it's made a big difference. Mm -hmm. because I think it increases serotonin in the system. So these clinical treatments that you've mentioned, I mean, we've clicked through a lot of them. Mm -hmm. uh, have they, uh, no one of them maybe is that helpful, but are they helpful taken all together? You know, not really. Uh, let's look at the next graphic here. The clinical treatments do not have a high success rate, unfortunately. And that's been documented by that's, the scientific literature. According to the reading I've done in the scientific literature, there has, there's not, the magic bullet hasn't been discovered yet. Now, you're a survivor. You got through it. Hopefully, when we come back, we'll, we'll, we'll learn more about what is effective. That's and right. uh, we'll look at that. We've been talking with Jennifer Swerger. She's written a book, Dying to be Beautiful. Excellent book. You can find more information about it on her website at jenniferjill.org. And uh, when we come back, we'll look at how she got through it. Maybe you'll find things, I know you'll find things that can help you join us when we come back. Have you found yourself wishing that you could shed a few pounds? Have you been on a diet for most of your life, but not found anything that will really keep the weight off? If you've answered yes to any of these questions, then we have a solution for you that works. Dr. Hans Deal and Dr. Eileen Lettington have written a marvelous booklet called Reversing Obesity Naturally. And we'd like to send it to you free of charge. Here's a medically sound approach successfully used by thousands who were able to eat more and lose weight permanently without feeling guilty or hungry through lifestyle medicine. Dr. Deal and Dr. Ludington have been featured on 3ABM. And in this booklet, they present a sensible approach to eating, nutrition, and lifestyle changes that can help you prevent heart disease, diabetes, and even cancer. 
Call her right today for your free copy of Reversing Obesity Naturally, and you could be on your way to a healthier, happier you. It's absolutely free of charge, so call her right today. Welcome back. We've been talking with Jennifer Swerger. She's written a book, Dying to be Beautiful, and it deals with anorexia and bulimia, a very uh, important and troubling subject for that percentage of people that really get caught within its grip. In this section, we're going to be talking with you about what happened to you, how you kind of overcame this. And, uh, you know, uh, there's hope, there's help, there's happiness at the end of the tunnel, right? That's right. I was saying before that the clinical treatments don't have a high success rate, but I want to clarify that you should try everything available. You should, you should bring everything to the table because this is a life or death issue for some people. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not saying that it never helps because often, you know, the thing that, that has a high success rate is the grace of God. Every person that I talked to interviewed for my book was in some way, shape, or form helped by the grace of God through their problem. Mm -hmm. and, and had some kind of spiritual testimony to give. So sometimes God uses, however, um, various channels, and sometimes he uses a therapist, or he might use a doctor, mm -hmm. or he might use a, a support group. So we need to leave those channels open because his grace can move through them as well. Right, and grace, of course, you know, the grace of God uh, teaches us that denying this or doing this or doing that. Right. Grace has many different things. The That's grace right. of God can... Uh, change distorted ideas That's it's right. cognitively behavioral your 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 thinking can change as a result of grace so a lot of these things can have elements of grace in them but uh, tell tell us about your story what happened how yeah. did the grace of god take you from being uh, you know what you were to what you are pretty sick to being well um, it was it was actually the love of an individual and god's love working through that individual i mentioned before that my husband had dealt with a certain type of anorexia himself. It was what you would call spiritual anorexia. As I mentioned before, there are two types. One is diet and fashion related. The other is related to religious exercises, a person trying to become more holy versus becoming more fashionable. And he was involved in some alternate religion and he ended up starving himself down to a very low weight, but survived was the experience. This, was this a tenet of the religion, to starve yourself down? What it was was macrobiotic um, diet, and okay. they had very strict ideas of what kinds of things you could and couldn't eat and portion control, but everybody else was binging, and he wasn't because he was very conscientious. So he ended up following the diet and almost dying from it. Mm. So because he had recovered... He, he was living in a, a community, and uh, he saw the leader of the community levitate off the ground. He said, I'm getting out of here. So that was it for him. And he ended up renting an apartment, collapsed on the floor. A girl that had met him came, and she nursed him with uh, chicken broth. He came back to health, and, or to life anyway, and he was able to start eating again. So he had survived that experience. And then he met hmm. me, and he could see me struggling with some of the same things. And it was through his love for me, his really his unconditional love for me, that I was able to see God's unconditional love and feel secure enough to overcome this problem. Um, the way it all panned out was uh, he and I were actually in a relationship. Mm -hmm. And he would warn me that I was heading down a very unhealthy path. He s would say, I've been through that and you need to eat more. And I would brush it off, you know, and as I did with just about everyone. And I was hovering around 95 pounds all the time. And that isn't like a severe anorexic really severe anorexics will continue to lose weight and finally die of starvation. But I was, I wanted to And you to were how there. tall? Not 5'6". Five, 5'6". Six. Five, six. I mean, it's okay to be 95 pounds, but if you're 5'6", that's kind of thin. That's too thin. It's like yeah. 20 pounds off of me now. So it was too thin. But I didn't think I needed any body fat or anything, and I, I felt I could be that weight, and I actually liked it. And that's the weird thing about anorexia is it's a, called an ego syntonic disease, meaning it's in sync with your ego. You like it. Yeah, Whereas you feel better even though no one is fighting your game. You're kind of... You Thank like you. it. You feel self-satisfied. Mm -hmm. Bulimia is the opposite. It's ego dystonic. But I was quite content being 95 pounds. I wanted to stay there, but I got a flu. And the flu lasted for a solid week. I couldn't eat anything. Mm. And so I went down to 85 pounds. Wow. And I remember being 85 pounds and getting in the bathtub. And I just felt the bones like straight against the porcelain of the bathtub. And it, in that moment, I had this epiphany that I was sick and that I needed to uh, to gain weight and so began the climb back up to a normal weight which was actually very difficult um, it's hard to conceive of that for people so that was where disclosure came in you That's said right. wait a minute I am that's right. huh, 
And then you made a decision. I made a decision. Um, I was getting married. Um, well, I regained the weight to my normal 95 pounds. But then once I got married, I realized that I needed to gain back to a normal weight. And so because I was in this secure relationship, this person that was going to stick with me through thick or thin, I was able to overcome a lot of thought patterns that had been sort of an addiction for now, me. Now, were you a Christian when you... Mm -hmm. Uh, met your husband Michael yes, I and, was. What, and he was now coming into Christianity or he, he was, was already a Christian too but he had been into some kind of Eastern religions right. and stuff and so you had you came yeah. together yeah amazingly the minute you become a Christian all your problems don't just instantly go away <laughs> have you noticed that <laughs> that, that is amazing <laughs> yes it is amazing yeah. so I still had some issues I had to deal with but in the context of my relationship with him I was able to, to deal with some of the underlying thinking and it was difficult for me to eat a normal amount of food when you've shrunk your stomach down and you've got into this mindset but by the grace of God I was back up to a whopping 120 you know within a few months of getting married. Wow so f since that time have you ever had like a relapse mentally? Did you ever say I'm going back to no food? Not at all. Um, I am the type of person that if I get really depressed about something, I will like have to remind myself to eat. Some people medicate with food. I'm the opposite. I'll just like flake out and I'll stop eating and sleeping. But um, I don't want to be skinny. I wish I could gain weight. In fact, if you know of any way that I can, I'd be glad to try it because um, I'm one of those people that's just chronically more active than the number of calories I take in. But it, mentally, I'm on a totally different page. Mm -hmm. I do not want to be thin. I do not want to get any thinner. I don't obsess about food. And you're able to, to even sometimes laugh about what happened even though it's not really <laughs> laughable in, oh, in some ways. I have to laugh about it. Yeah. I mean I used to make all kinds of food. Typically anorexics will make food for other people. They won't eat it. Some of them will wash their hands repeatedly so they don't absorb calories through their skin. Whoa. I wasn't that bad. But I'd make all kinds of food for him and, and he would eat it. But now I make food for me. Like I've been making fudge trying to perfect this this fudge recipe, you know, and I, I eat it. Now you, a lot. you have you actually. This is kind of ironic, but you moved from, from uh, I guess uh, what you just said might make this a little different. But you moved from like not eating food to now having a restaurant, yeah. eating food yourself, and and uh, serving it to serving other it to other people. But like I said, anorexic will uh, anorexics will often re really cook a lot of food for other people, but they won't eat it themselves. But yeah, I had this restaurant for three years and developed a menu and prioritized that the food had to taste good yeah you know <laughs> so but I want to I want to just highlight one individual that I interviewed in the process of doing research for the book her name was Lacey and she went down to um, she went down to 57 pounds 57 how tall was she She was 5'4 so she Whoa. wasn't short um, she had moved away from her home of origin to a place where she was not able to connect socially when she was an adolescent Mm -hmm. And because she had a difficult time connecting, she was very lonely. Finally, she got in with a group of girls who were pathological dieters, and she said, ah, this is the key to acceptance, is, is being thin. She looked at them, they were thin, she started to become thin. And to make a long story short, she went down over uh, several months to extremely dangerous weight. And finally, one week, uh, nothing seemed to be helping. She went in for her weekly weighing and it was found that she weighed 57 pounds. Mm. You know, just the, the family was traumatized. The mother and daughter were just crying in each other's arms. Uh, they wanted to send her to a, another facility where she could live in, but th the mother didn't feel the girl would survive the trip, the plane flight. So they made this desperate decision, and this is so interesting to me. They decided that they would go back to where she was healthy. So she, they went back to her hometown that she had moved from when all this began. Mm. And in route to the town, a medical miracle took place. And they pulled over to the side of the road, and she ordered a sandwich and ate a full meal for the first time in years. Wow, was that dangerous to eat a big meal once well, you have it for a yeah. while? Well, yeah. I mean, you can, you can overeat, you know, and, and mm -hmm. you've got to gradually. But the change in her mind, just because of the location of going back to a place uh, where she was healthy. And then once she got there, she met her family and her friends at a restaurant, ate again. And that began her road to recovery. And to me, the thing that is, that is made obvious in that story is the fact that love heals people. Mm. So what happened to me, you know, somebody loved me. And in the context of that security, I was able to overcome. I was able to value myself enough to feed myself, basically. Mm -hmm. And the same thing was true of her. She, she was, suddenly had a reason to live. Well, 
this book, again, weaves all these stories together, dying to be That's beautiful. Right. And uh, now you're living because you are beautiful. Well, and I wouldn't because go that far. you are, well, what I mean, <laughs> what I mean is that you see yourself as beautiful in God's eyes because you see yourself as He sees you, and that is a person of value. That's the, right. It's not based so much on anything in me, Don, mm -hmm. as it's based on the value that He placed on me. And I think that's a crucial point because as soon as people turn to themselves to say, I'm good, I'm beautiful, I high self esteem because I have all these qualities. You know, those things are very fragile, and often they're based on being better than someone else. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very fragile situation. But if you base your self-worth on, on the price that Jesus paid for you on the cross and also on the difference that you can make in the world, serving others and blessing others, that is a solid foundation. What would you say to the person watching right now, maybe a family member or actually someone struggling with anorexia or bulimia? What would you say? What are the steps you would take right now as you're watching this program? Uh, you know, and, and within the spiritual context as well. Well, I would first of all get on your knees and pray. This person has a disorder or possibly has a disorder that could, could lead to, you know, death. permanent problems or ultimately death. Serious situation. Um, not only that, but they're totally engrossed in something that's taking their eyes off of what's really important, and that is their soul salvation and their mission in life. Mm -hmm. And so they're co consumed with something that's taking them off the path. So get on your knees and pray that this person becomes all that they can be in Christ. And then approach that person once you've prayed and try to get them to be honest with you about their problem if they to have it. To disclose it. To disclose, that's right. And, but before you do any of that, actually, let's back up a minute, is do some research, do some reading. Be Go to your website, jenniferjill.org. Get your book, Dying to be Beautiful, is a good start, but there's many other resources. Many other resources, which I list in the book as well. Mm -hmm. So become informed. And then um, once you go to the person, if you can get them to the place where they're willing to admit they're struggling, then you can connect them, that you can lead them to a decision to do something, and you can give them some options as to how they can do something. And that's just the beginning. It may be that one facility doesn't help, one counselor doesn't help, but they can keep trying. Give them a sense that there is hope and that they can change, because it's, it's true that they can. Thank you so much for spending the time, Jennifer, with us, and for writing the book. I mean, look. It takes a lot of energy to write a book. I just recently worked on one of those projects. <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a big project. Thank you for the research. Thank you also for pulling that team together in the book. And, and also, thank you for just being completely honest yeah. about your situation. That's really helpful. And thank you for watching us here today on Health for a Lifetime. You've, you've heard some excellent information. You can, again, get more information about this book by going to Jennifer's website, jenniferjill.com. O -R -G, and the title of the book is Dying to be Beautiful. It has all kinds of resources on the website and in the book. And we hope that you will find things there that will just increase the effectiveness of this program, the information that you've watched today.